Thank you, Sasha. Uh, Your Grace, Chief Justice, Chief Counsel, fellow commissioners, and many, many here dear friends. Um, I'm quite humbled to be here, and I'm very grateful and thankful you're giving me the opportunity to effectively give you a complete overview uh, of what I have discovered by talking to many people, some from the inside. Um, I've been privileged enough to have people approach me and tell me stuff, and then we've double-checked. Um, I really believe now we know what's going on out there. The deep state, now the definition, I'm using the phrase deep state because a few of us at the UK column, British Constitution Group and New Chartist Movement, we started using this and the deep state is believed to be a clandestine network entrenched inside the government, bureaucracy, intelligence agencies and other governmental entities, not to mention the mainstream media. The deep state supposedly controls state policy behind the scenes while the democratically elected process and elected officials are merely figureheads. In other words, they are puppets. And we need to find out who are the puppeteers. Now, I'm going to show you some harrowing photographs in a moment, deliberately. In today's world, what sort of mindset allows this sort of thing to happen. I'm going to show you some pictures, and I want you to just think very carefully. We've all experienced famines in the developing countries. We've seen disasters. We've seen where people, you know, the governments have turned their back on their people, and we've seen appalling things. So I'm just going to show you three or four quick photographs. That I don't think I need to say anymore. Nor that one. And that is how we expect billions of people in the world to live. You know, it's horrendous, and yet they put up with it. I put that photograph in because here's an example of a chemical attack. Bear in mind events over the last few days of what's just happened, because we've accused another country of doing something which a lot of people now don't think believe is true, and we'll come on to that l later. There's a picture that's very famous, and you have to say, napalm. Nice stuff. And here's something from the Iraq war. A baby suffering from the effects of depleted uranium. Not very nice. <clears throat> now this is a slightly contrived picture, but I think the message is extraordinarily powerful. Miss another payment and we take the blanket. And we have an economic and political system that effectively allows the 62 richest people in the world to control as much or to own as much as three and a half billion people of the world. Now those figures have come from Oxfam International. I have no reason to doubt them. So it's a rather unfair economic system that we have. So extreme poverty, extreme wealth. How can we ever, ever justify this? You look at that picture on the left, and we're here about children, about what's happening to them, about child trafficking and everything else. They are living in an economy that allows that to happen. And then you go to places like Cannes or wherever in the south of France, and you see all the luxury boats. Many of them are owned by the bankers and the people who control the world's money. So there's an elephant in the room. The question we are all avoiding and asking, is there some sort of hidden hand or governance controlling, behind the, well, controlling the world behind our backs? Now, this is a picture of the first ever Bilderberg Group meeting in 1934, actually at the Hotel Bilderberg in Holland. If you look behind, you'll see a blue, light blue arrow pointing onto the head of somebody. That somebody is my late uncle by marriage, Sir Harry Pilkington, later the Lord Pilkington. He was a really nice man, Pilkington's glass. He was much respected in his community. I loved him very much. He told me two things on the train in 1972. 
Just after that conference, he was made a director of the Bank of England, and he had that position from 1955 to 1972. And it was on the train going, I was going back to school, and he was actually going to London for one of the last meetings of the Bank of England as a director. And he was giving me some advice to take through life because he was asking what I wanted to do in life, you know, what career pattern I had mapped out. He said, I'm going to give you two bits of useful advice, two bits of information you must take through your life with you. First is, never believe, you, never believe anything you read in the press because we control it. And secondly, never believe a politician when they say they can do something. They can't unless we say they can. Now, age 16, it just went straight over the top. I remember that, but I didn't. I, I, I sort of semi-thought, well, he's a banker, industrialist. It probably means, you know, you've got to make sure British industry is on your side or something. But I had no idea what he really meant by that, but I remembered it very well indeed. However, as the years progressed and I started to listen to various speakers, David Icke, one of them, and many others, I suddenly realized that the Bilderberg Group, there were many others. And there's a list I've just put on the board. Bilderberg, Trilateral, the Council on Foreign Relations, European Council on Foreign Relations, the Pilgrim Group, the Skull and Bones, the Bohemian Grove, the Rhodes Club, the Committee of 300, and there are many others, which we probably don't really know. And the interesting, the interesting thing is I know politicians, including one who's actually in Parliament at the moment, who go, who's been to Bilderberg, who's been on the Council on Foreign Relations and the European Council on Foreign Relations. And I collared him, I said, look, you've been democratically elected by your, your electorate. Um, surely you should be accountable at all times and transparent to your electorate. He looked at me and I said, you've been to Bilderberg. What was discussed there? I can't discuss that, you know that. I said, well, you know, is it right that you are an elected servant in Parliament and you are not making people aware of what's been discussed behind closed doors amongst the most powerful people on the planet. And he just smiled and said, you have your ideas, I have mine. And it was his arrogance, I won't give you his name, out of fairness to him, but it was his arrogance which appalled me. Right, what's that? A picture of a Star Wars Death Star. Now, why on earth have I put that up? <coughs> the Death Star. Well, there is an organisation behind the scenes that you could liken to the Death Star. Or as my friend David Pidcock, who I owe a tremendous amount to, uh, he's been a, a, a money campaigner for many, many, many years, along with a gentleman called Ken Palmerton, and I owe a tremendous amount to both of them. He calls it the Debt Star. <laughs> And the organization I'm referring to, and uh, I think, Ronnie, you like this, is none other than this organization. Now, this ugly building in Basel in Switzerland, which is a, a lovely, you know, Switzerland's lovely, Basel is lovely, but there is one hideous, ugly building. And that is the Bank for International Settlements. Now, before I describe what the Bank for International Settlements does, I just want to show you this picture of another bank. Where do you think this bank is? I think the clue is in the soldiers. We are looking there at the Vatican Bank. Isn't it strange, what a coincidence, that the architecture of that bank is not dissimilar to the Tower of Basel, as it's nicknamed. Anyway. I would just say at this stage that a lot of research now is starting to suggest, you know, the old saying that all roads lead to Rome, uh, maybe just to one part of Rome, or actually, because the Vatican is um, a, a, a state in its own right, as is the city of London and Washington, D.C., but maybe we'll come on to that later. So, the Bank for International Settlements. The BIS is privately controlled and has given itself diplomatic immunity. I wish, you know, we could just go around giving ourselves diplomatic immunity. I'd like to. Uh, I might even get to America next time. Anyway, I guess. 
It controls 60 of the world's central banks, including the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, and the European Central Bank. It oversees over 95% of the world's money supply. It uses extreme secrecy to, to operate. The minutes taken at its top-level meetings are never made public. And barely 1% of the world's population knows anything about this international organization that hides behind the IMF, the OECD, and the World Bank. Everyone's heard of the IMF, the OECD, and the World Bank. Politicians, I mean, up until quite recently, because I've been badgering them about the Bank for International Settlement, virtually every politician I came across had never heard of the Bank for International Settlements. In fact, when I met my present MP, Sarah Wollaston, I think she's probably you know, not very happy that I'd moved into her constituency, but I, I, I smiled and shook her hand, and the first question was, having said hello, was, have you ever heard of the Bank for International Settlement? No. So, you know, there's an organization that controls over 95% of the world's money, and she has never heard of it. Who were the founders of the Bank for International Settlements? Well, one chap was Helmut Schlacht, Hitler's finance minister, and Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England from 1920 until 1944. So they created the Bank for International Settlements in 1930. It was designed originally to oversee Germany's war reparations to the victorious allies, but somehow it morphed away from that and joined the actual war, it was the recipient of much Nazi gold and various other things, and in fact, Montague Norman came under a great deal of criticism during the Second World War by Churchill. And we also have a record that Montague Norman and Halma Schlacht actually met in Switzerland during the Second World War. So that means you had the bankers meeting, <coughs> German bankers, British bankers, meeting behind the scenes in Switzerland. And we've got the minutes, thanks to David Pinkham. <coughs> yep. Now, this chap, uh, Professor Carol Quigley. Um, now, he wrote this book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, uh, in 1966. Now, he's not a household name, Carol Quigley, but he was the mentor for Bill Clinton. And he advised and helped Bill Clinton on his political career, teaching him history and various other things. But of course, Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar. But what was interesting is that, um, that uh, how should I put it, Carol Quigley himself was allowed into some of the innermost meetings. In other words, he was accepted as an insider, even though he was an academic. And in his book, he wrote this, and I'm going to read it in full, because it's very, very important. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching <coughs> aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert, by secret agreements, arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. The growth of financial capitalism made possible a centralization of world economic control and use of this power for the direct benefit of financiers and the indirect injury of all other economic groups. What a damning statement. Mm -hmm. Professor Quigley goes on. It must not be felt that these heads of the world's chief central banks were themselves substantive powers in world finance. They were not. Rather, they were the technicians and agents of the dominant investment bankers of their own countries who had raised them up and were perfectly capable of throwing them down. The substantive financial powers of the world were in the hands of these investment bankers, also called international or merchant bankers, who renamed largely behind the scenes in their own unincorporated banks. 
These formed a system of international cooperation and national dominance which was more private, more powerful and more secret than that of their agents in the central banks. So there we are. We're talking about the House of Rothschilds, the Warburgs, the Rockefellers, the Goldman Sachs, the Oppenheim, the Medici and the Morgan Stanley families. They're all out there. And between them all, they own half the world's money. So this is the question. Why does the human race, that's us, allow a tiny handful of dynastic families to decide just how much money, more accurately, just how little money the world has to spend? Right. This is the truth. Any sovereign nation anywhere in the world can create, issue and control the money it needs to meet the needs and happiness and prosperity of their people. And you base that money around the wealth of the nation. Now I'm going to move on quite quickly because we have got a lot to go through. But basically this was in the Bank of England. They actually said in the modern economy most money takes the form of bank deposits. But how those bank deposits are created is often misunderstood. The principal way is through commercial banks making loans. Whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. In other words, they create it out of thin air. Now, Britain in 1914 created a note called the Bradbury Pound. It was called Bradbury because John Bradbury signed it. Now, the story behind this, and I, have, I can't go into too much detail, but it was written about by a guy called the Right Honourable Thomas Johnston, a thoroughly decent politician in the 1930s, and he wrote a book called The Financiers and the Nation. And really, this is meant to be the big secret they don't want you to know about. Now, joint, when the outbreak of the First World War, they shut down all the banks on bank holiday, and they kept them shut because they were worried about people going to the banks and taking their gold out because the run of the banks with the uncertainty of the First World War. In two days, they passed a Currency and Banknotes Act on the August of 6, 1914. David Lloyd George was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. On August the 7th, 1914, the Treasury notes were available. I've got one here. And these notes are Treasury notes, not done by the Bank of England, and they are based on the wealth and the credit and, and, and also the labour potential, that's the creativity of the nation. So effectively, this is real money. This is based on something. Like you have money which is based on gold, this is based on the nation's assets and credit. And jo Thomas Johnson said, this new currency had been issued by the state, was backed by the credit of the state, and was issued to the banks to prevent the banks from utter collapse. The public cheerfully accepted the new notes, and nobody talked about inflation. And there it is. So why did he suddenly stop doing that? Because, very simply, the bankers went running back, having been saved from a collapse. They then said, hang on a moment, we can't make a killing out of the killing. We can't suddenly start borrowing money that doesn't exist to you for exchange of bonds. And we can't make any money out of this war. So David Lloyd George caved in. They, they phased out the Bradburys over the years. And as a result, our national debt went up from 650 million pounds in 1914 to 7,500 million in 1918 and the banks did very well indeed out of the um, First World War and indeed the Second World War and, war and all wars since. Now we can bring back this Bradbury Pound, it is called M0 100% by the Treasury and if we brought it back austerity cutbacks would be a null with immediate effect, all forms of direct taxation would come to an end the NHS, the vulnerable and the elderly in our society would have all the resources needed. Student fees would be abolished. Education at all levels would be free. Students already in debt would have their debts annulled. The armed services and the police service would be restored to levels needed for our country's sovereignty, security and safety. People would be encouraged to set up their own human scale businesses, whilst at the same time greatly increasing the number of apprenticeships for young people. Shipbuilding, steel making, and other strategically important industries would be protected and given a new lease of life. Roads, railways, power stations, and other vital infrastructure for the nation would be maintained and constructed to very high levels of standard. Now, bear in mind, if we do it, every nation in the world will do this. Mm. It's not going to be just Britain going it alone. Every nation will click, all the people in the world will click. This is how money should be created, and poverty would be put into the dustbin. 
It is that simple. Don't let the economists try and tell you it's more complicated. It isn't. And trust me, I've got insiders <coughs> doing that, including, as I say, I can't say too many, but there is two people from the City of London quite high up backing us. Right. In the event of a sudden global crash of the financial markets, and I won't read the whole lot up, we haven't got time, but effectively, the government in seconds could simply switch to the principle of N0 at 100% Bradbury Pound and all the lawful part of our economy would be protected from a contrived collapse by the international banks. It really is that simple. <laughs> Moving on, I'm going to come on. That's the money side. So there's a solution to the money. Poverty gone. Now we want justice. Now we want to make sure the people are in charge, not the politicians, or should we say the puppet, well, the puppets and the puppeteers. Right, the Great Charter, Magna Carta, 1215. A wonderful document. Now, Britain is a common law country. What do we mean by common law country? All trials of justice must involve a jury of randomly selected people. A judge is only there to ensure that the trial is conducted in a fair and proper way. The jury decides not only what the verdict is, but also what the sentence may be. A jury has the absolute right to annul bad and unjust legislation passed by Parliament. So despite what the politicians may think, we the people are sovereign and not Parliament. Now, what's actually happening in Britain today? We have Parliament passing huge numbers of Roman civil law acts and statutes to unlawfully micromanage our lives. Common law is all, you can do what you like until you invade somebody else's freedom. That put very crudely what common law is. What we're having now is every part of our, life, of our lives is being micromanaged by our elected servants in Parliament. We have judges acting as both judge and jury in corporate star chamber courts, which are registered as places of business. Look at Dun & Bradstreet, you'll see all these places registered as corporations, as companies. We have courts, in inverted comma, of law, in inverted comma, undertaking fraudulent bankruptcies that have stolen billions of pounds from completely innocent people. And you will hear about all that later on. And we have the City of London stealing from everyone. My God, there's going to be a lot of cleaning out when we, get, when we take over. And we will take over, because we are the 99%. We are the people. And once this information is out there, people are not going to sit down and say, well, I'm not going to do anything with that information. They're going to act, as long as it's done peacefully and lawfully. So, now I'm, here's a question for you. Is Parliament made up of independent, thoroughly decent and selfless MPs who practice wisdom, integrity, humility and compassion and who always go where the provable truth is? I won't wait for your answer. <laughs> Brexit. This is, again, another elephant in the room. The European Union can trace its roots from Nazi Germany. The BIS central banking system supported by the creation of the EU, setting up of the European Central Bank. The EU Commission is unaccountable, secretive and dislikes the sovereignty of individual nations. Uh, despite Brexit, Britain's armed services are being systematically unified with those armed services in the EU. That's going on at the moment. It's called the PESCO process. And finally, the Brexit vote is being overturned by money, big money. We know that there's a party with a war chest of something like 50 million pounds funded by people who are probably not the nicest people in the world, but Tony Blair and his son are there and a few others, and they are waiting to bamboozle the people of this country into re basically to renege on, well, to have another vote to stay in the European Union. So it's essential that people get to hear the truth about what's really going on. Now, there's another elephant in the room, and this is relevant to why we're here today, establishment led paedophile rings and the organized and ritual abuse of children. This has got to get out into the public arena. I urge everyone to research Holly Gregg, Melanie Shaw, John Wedger, and you'll be hearing from John uh, tomorrow, whatever. So this is obviously a real elephant in the room, but there are some appalling things going on in high level paedophile rings. False flag, problem, reaction, solution. I won't dwell on that, but 9-11 is a pack of lies from beginning to end. Uh, I've talked to airline pilots, disaster managers, people who are there, and the overwhelming conclusion is you cannot, cannot uh, trust the official narrative of what happened on that day. 
the whole war on terror is contrived, all events since have to be questioned, and I urge people to do so. Perverted science. We've got profit-driven big pharma controlling our health service. We've got free energy research actively discouraged. Nikola Tesla, obviously, the solutions. Art, un, uncontrolled artificial <coughs> intelligence AI heading towards transhumanism. That is the deliberate merging of human beings with machines. Secretive geoengineering and weather modification. Invasive surveillance technologies and smart cities. And Agenda 2130. From human beings, we're becoming corporate slaves. And the idea is that we're eventually they would like us all living in smart cities where they can totally keep an eye on what we're doing and that we all do as we're told and we're jolly good little slaves. When the people fear their government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Thomas Jefferson. I think that is a brilliant phrase. I love this. Um, Good old Percy Shelley. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just a, a quick one before we go. I'm helping get started a thing called the Chartist, new Chartist movement. The Chartists are back. The 2018 People's Charter to expose and peacefully collapse the influence of a deep state. These are our six requirements to fully restore our common law trial by jury constitution, whereby we, the people, are sovereign, to restore sovereign national credit by bringing back the Bradbury Pound, to expose and bring to justice establishment-led paedophilia, and to, to protect, and to protect all children from abuse, to ensure that our armed services and police service are fit for purpose, to expose and collapse the unlawful Roman civil law legal system that uses outright fraud, deception and entrapment in the courts, and finally to rid the world of perverted science that harms people and the planet. And that is my presentation. Well, that's Thank you very much. We are the power behind the ITNJ. Add your voice. Sign the treaty.